to be here and uh, an enormous honor to be here. I was actually at the NCI at the same time. I was actually in, and, uh, you know, it was in the early, early to mid seventies, actually at the same time as uh, Vince was there and, and Jose was there. And it was an extraordinary time of creativity and imagination and enthusiasm. And so all of us were there at that time, kind of feel bonded like brothers uh, because, because, because of that. I took the, the topic very seriously because uh, I am a clinician. I see patients, um, you know, uh, Tuesday's my heavy clinical day, so I'm still exhausted, um, uh, you know, from that. Uh, and I'm actually mathematically trained uh, and, uh, I'm still publishing in the mathematics literature, actually pure mathematics literature. Um, uh, and in addition to that, I've had the great honor and pleasure of working with experimental biologists for most of my career. So I'm going to touch all those areas uh, a little tiny bit to try to weave them together into, into a story. And the story is really based on my, as a clinician, my struggle to understand clinical problems uh, that uh, or, um, uh, that presented themselves to me really as a, as, as a physician as somebody who, uh, you know, actually sees patients. Um, uh, the first one was with Hodgkin's disease. I'll mention that when I, when, when I talk about that. And, and now it's the issue of precision medicine and, uh, and its integration into oncology. Um, Jose, for my entire career, has been very influential. And I think that the influence um, is, is pretty apparent in this quote from him that I, I pulled from somewhere uh, that talks about uh, cancer being a, a, an evolutionary process involving populations of different kinds of cells that are working together. Uh, and this, this can explain heterogeneity as well as, this is the fast, fascinating part of it for me, uh, the long-term failures of some therapies. We've gotten really good in the precision medicine space at um, identifying targets and using drugs and making tumors shrink for a short period of time. We've been very, very bad at curing people. And I think that's one of the really pressing issues that we really have to address and that our thinking in this, in this um, uh, symposium uh, may, may, may help us address and certainly uh, you know, um, what I've learned so far from conversations with my colleagues, I, I think is, has already been influential and I intend to continue those conversations. Um, so my talk is about dissecting the complexity of cancer. And I'm gonna start by talking about the problem. Then I'm gonna talk about an, an approach, one approach toward the explanation, and then try to explain the explanation using biology. Um, uh, and then talk about some clinical implications, one clinical implication and another couple of clinical implications and yet another. So I'm going to start with the problem and then try to explain it and try to see where we can go with this as therapists. The problem, the enigma is, is this, and I'm a breast cancer clinical oncologist, so I'm going to just use breast cancer as my main illustration here. Uh, we, know that different can we know that we can classify breast cancers into major groups uh, by their RNA expression patterns. Luminal A is very hormone responsive and, uh, and have certain patterns. All the way luminal Bs, they look like they should be hormone responsive, but they're not, and they're very, they're very bad. They're really bad actors, Claude and Lowe, and basal like breast cancers uh, with the informal designation triple negative, don't have estrogen progesterone receptor, don't have HER2 as targets, and then the HER2 enriched tumors that can respond to anti HER2 therapy. And we know that these, and these have real clinical significance in its expression, and it tells us something about biology. And then we know that they, they fall into patterns where there are different DNA mutations that are associated with these different types. So you see pic 3 ca being abnormal in a very high percentage of the luminal A's that are very hormone responsive, for example, you know, and, and we have P3 abnormalities, which are very classic for triple negative and so on. And many classification schemes have been brought forward to try to tie the molecular observations with the clinical observations, with, with, uh, with, with expression patterns, really, and so on. More than that, we know those mutations are key to certain pathways. This is the famous Hanahan Weinberg. Um, this is the you know model that says there are certain characteristics of tumors that uh, that are very that are very typical. Um, you know, won't go through all of them, but obviously they grow. They they don't respond well to the immune system. You know, they induce angiogenesis and so on. And therefore, we've had an explosion of of industrial level activities to develop drugs that are, can target all these various mutations. And this is the extraordinary interest and promise of, uh, of precision medicine, molecularly-based medicine, uh, so on. And, and we have literally hundreds of drugs that have been developed that actually are very specific for the abnormalities that are caused by those mutations and those expression patterns the proteins derived therefrom. And all of it sounds very logical and all of it sounds very reasonable. The problem is we're not curing many people. And so there's a disconnect between a very logical, rational story and actual clinical experience. 
And what, what I would like to address for a few minutes is some ideas of why, all right? Now, I'm saying this not as a naysayer. I'm, I'm up to my teeth in precision medicine research at Memorial Sloan Kettering, putting people on clinical trials and doing a whole variety of things. I was involved with discovery of BRCA1. You know, I was involved, you know, with, uh, you know, with development of trastuzumab or septin for HER2 positive disease, which is kind of close to trial for precision medicine in oncology. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a naysayer, but I'm also realistic. And I'm saying is that all this logic is not necessarily leading us to where I want to be really as a clinician or where my patients want to be when they present with a cancer. So I'd like to break my answer down, all right, into a few parts. And, and basically, I'd like to talk about the notion of complexity, which is actually a mathematical discipline, and also my own personal work in tumor growth kinetics, and link these things together to try to answer the question about why we're not making progress despite the wonderful science that we have and maybe what we can do to move things forward. Well, precise targeting needs a precise target. That's pretty obvious. And what you really want if an elephant is really chasing you down is a sharpshooter with one bullet can fell this elephant. If this is your problem, the last thing you need is a sharpshooter. Uh, and, and so the answer to this, and I'm giving you the formal answer that my colleagues who are really very dedicated to precision medicine, it's very simple, which you need is a whole bunch of sharpshooters. And, um, and then and you gotta be able to sort of coordinate it. The combination precision therapy is going to be the answer. The, my, my dear friends who are great luminaries of the field really, really, really address this. Um, I personally don't think it's gonna work just in that way. And that simple combinations of precision medicines are not likely to solve complexity. And I think there are two reasons for that. The first of them is that gene gene networks are intrinsically unpredictable. And this goes against um, a lot of intuitive feelings that we have that if we really understand all the molecular basis, that we can make actual predictions. And the reason we feel that is because of the work of this man, Sir Isaac Newton. And Sir Isaac Newton trying to figure out, basically explain Kepler's laws of planetary motion by having a mathematical theory of how planetary bodies relate one to the other, um, uh, made a hypothesis about uh, gravitation and about, about the mathematics of gravitation and wrote a paper about it in 1687. He tried to get it published in Cell or Nature and he couldn't get in, couldn't get past the reviewers. And so he had to, he had to self-publish it in his own book, poor guy, you know? But despite, the, despite that fact, he was actually became, you know, became famous. And, and basically, by the way, he was, he was mostly a religious scholar. And he, he thought that if you really understand the mathematics of the way the stars and the heavens work, that you can understand God. And, and you know, basically the whole idea is of, of, of the mathematics of motion is if, if you can measure something in motion, uh, you can tell where it's gonna be any time in the future going off to infinity and where it was any time in the past going back to the, to, to, you know, to the birth, of, birth of the universe uh, because it's all very, very predictable. And this was a very dominant thought. I still think it's a dominant thought among biologists is that if we just understand you get rid of gravity here and you make a gene gene interactions that we could really predict things with great accuracy. In fact, in the mathematics world, in the physics world, for a long time, we've known that the Newtonian universe is not applicable. And this is actually in the 19th century, the King of Sweden had a prize and, uh, for the best mathematical theory. And uh, Henri Poincaré proved definitively that Newton's laws of motion work for two bodies in space. But once you get a third body in space, that the equations can't give you precise predictions. They can give you probability spaces. And so knowing everything you want to know about gravitational forces uh, and, uh, and you take away all, all contaminating outside influences, still the equations can't be solved absolutely. They can only be solved with certain kind of probability spaces. And other mathematics have been built on this for years and physicists know this for years. And, um, and you know, anybody who's raised children know about the fact that even though you know everything that went into their education and their training and every, all the values you impart to them, you can't predict necessarily their behavior. All right. Um, and, and, you know, as, and, and I'm, a, I'm a grandfather and it gets even more pronounced when you talk about grandchildren. So the, the point of the matter is, is that we've known in the mathematical literature and the physics literature for a very long period of time that, that we can make absolute predictions and the Newtonian university universe falls apart. But the main reason that I'd like to give why precision medicine is not necessarily giving us the results that, that, that we have so far is because the underlying model of combination therapy is wrong. The underlying model started with the work of Howard Skipper, Frank Schabel, uh, Griswold, Wilcox, and others, the Southern Research Institute, on contract to the National Cancer Institute 
it, roughly in the, in the period, uh, the decade or so before Jose and Vince and I you know, were really very active in, in, in cancer student 70s, it's mostly in the 60s. And Howard Skipper developed a, a, an animal model for anti-cancer therapy, which was chemotherapy predominantly. Uh, this shows simple exponential growth, logarithmic growth of, 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 of a model. They used a experimental leukemia called L1210. And if you give one drug, reproducibly, you kill a certain percentage of the cells that are present, not an absolute number of cells. So it would be 90% for administration, which is a one log reduction on log to the base 10. And therefore, you know, they called it the log kill model. And the remarkable thing that, that was discovered in this work is that if you use two drugs and they each cause a one log reduction, use them two together, you get a two log reduction. Use three together, you get a three log reduction. So you know, one drug, 90%. Another, you add another drug to it, you kill 99. You could another, add another drug to it, it's 99.9 and so on. And if you start off with any reasonable number of cells, you should be below the volume of a single cell and you should be able to cure everything. And when I was training in oncology, I had very wise people tell me, you better work on another field also, like cardiology or nephrology or something else, because cancer is not going to be a problem anymore. Because once we have cancer drugs and we put three of them together, we're done. All right. Do you remember those days? Yeah. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's all over, you know, and, and, and actually Vince was kind of a leader of that. He's, he's got a very bad cold, so he's not here today. But he really thought that, you know, MOP, he, he added the fourth drug to MOP because three will do it. So let's add another one and we'll really be able to do it. And, and, they, and it worked for Hodgkin's. It really worked for Hodgkin's. And, and, and it was dramatic. And it changed everybody's notion of, uh, of the fact that can, can, cancer really can be cured with drugs. And if you put them together and, uh, and you give them at adequate dosages, the patients might get sick, but the sickness just goes away and the cancer doesn't, doesn't come back. And this was just a revolution in, in everybody's thinking because literally in medical school, I was taught that cancer will never be cured with drugs, forget it. And then, and then all of a sudden the, 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 uh, the, the mop experience changed everybody's, everybody's mind in that direction. And we thought that all of it is gonna be simple like that. And we just have to develop mop type regimens for all diseases. So I started working on this in the 70s when I was at the NCI because what was bothering me is I was treating a lot of those patients with mop chemotherapy, all right? And I had patients that would roar into complete remission with a few cycles, and we'd give them six full cycles, which was the standard therapy, even though they were in complete remission after two or three cycles. And then a year or two later, they would pop back in the same nodal areas with the same histology of Hodgkin's disease. The slides looked identical. And I couldn't figure out why uh, if you just listen to the log kill model, uh, how the cells are surviving. It's mathematically impossible for them to survive, roaring into complete remission at that point. And so I started looking for other ways of trying to understand the, uh, you know, the process. Uh, because I was at the NCI at the time, we had contracts. And so you know, people grew animal tumors for us and gave me all the raw data. And, um, and I was putting all this raw data into the computer system. And, and finally, Richard Simon, who I was working with, said, Larry, you're putting so much data into the system that your, 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 storage, your storage expenses are exceeding your salary. So, <laughs> so what you got to do is, uh, not that my salary was so high at the point, but the storage expenses were exceeding it. And so you got you to figure out some way of summarizing the data so that it doesn't, uh, so you're not storing all these raw data points. So I sat up late at night. And I said, I have all these data on tumor growth curves. If I fit a curve to it and I save the parameters of the curve, then with a few parameters, I can describe the whole curve and I don't have to have all the raw data points. I'll keep the raw data points in a card catalog or something somewhere. And, uh, but, and the computer would actually just store the things. And so I did it. I worked, I put in all the data and I fit curves. And I found the curve that fit best was the Domperts curve, which is uh, the semi log in the plot. It's not a straight line, but it actually bends over. And, uh, and it bends over as a function of time. And so I put all the data in the, in the computer. And then the very last thing I did before I turned off the computer, remember no desktops in those days, there's a mainframe and I've got a connection to the mainframe and they're gonna close the mainframe down at a certain time. So I had to leave. I said, I have all these parameters, all right? Let me just for fun, for absolutely no reason, to, just to see all these parameters somehow correlated with each other. There was absolutely no reason for me to, to, to think that they might be. And the degree of correlation was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, essentially correlation coefficients close to one. Um, and it blew me away. And I, I, I'd like to say it was some insight that made me draw me, but it was absolutely just, just, let me just play with the numbers a little bit. Let me see what it was. And it turns out that, that indeed the, the parameters of the Gompertz equation are very highly correlated. Nobody has ever found an example where they weren't. All right. And so this was 1976. All right. This was the first paper I ever published in Nature. All right. Just so there. 
And um, so, you know, so there Newton, ha, I got in. So the, um, so, so the, uh, and that in this kind of situation, so much so that if you have a few early data points, you can predict growth weeks and weeks later because of the predictability of the Gompertz curves in this particular situation. Being a cancer therapist, however, that was an interesting observation, but it stuck in my mind is why. Just, just was sitting in the back of my brain. Really had no good hypothesis for this. But I also, on contract, we treated some of these tumors and we saw the way they shrunk in response to therapy. And so the next, by the next year, we published a, an observation, all right? It's not obvious on this because you have to do the math. And the observation was the very fact is that the curves that resolve after therapy are also Gumpertzian. And fascinatingly, the, when it's growing faster and the faster growing part of the Gumpertzian curve, it shrinks more in response to the same therapy than it's, when it's growing more slowly in the gum protein part of the curve. The rate of regression is proportional to the rate of growth, which is very different than log kill. Log kill is always the same portion, all right? The proportion changes as a function of where the tumor is on its individual growth curve, all right? Again, why? I had no concept why, but it was an empirical observation. Um, but because of this, there was an obvious clinical implication, which, and through many iterations, that if we were going to use our drugs properly, what we were doing was wrong. We were using them all together in strict combinations. We should do them sequentially, and we should try to squeeze the doses closer, closer together in time, which, which I term dose density uh, rather than dose escalation, higher doses escalation. Dose density is just using closer in time because the mathematics just said this is a better way of killing the cancer cells. Uh, and this was actually, this is a, from a textbook, 2009, but this is actually published in 1977. Then I had to earn my chops in the clinical research world until 1997 when I could start a clinical trial uh, to actually test these ideas. So there's 20 years there, basically just kind of earning the respectability of my community in the clinical research world. And eventually it got tested in 97. And uh, very, very recently, and the paper is going to come out very soon, it's accepted in Lancet, uh, is other people try to, to disprove it, prove it, work on it, so on and so Total of 34,000 patients have been on randomized trials testing the ideas of sequential dose dense therapy in one form or another. And so this paper is going to be coming out in the Lancet very soon, which is the experience with 34,000 patients analyzed by Richard Pito and team at Oxford, or what they call the Early Breast Cancer Trials Collaborative Group. If you give two week chemotherapy versus the same chemotherapy given every three weeks, there's a statistically significant reduction in, in, in uh, recurrence and a statistically significant reduction in breast cancer mortality. These are all trials. Some are better than others, but, 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 but on the average, this is, this is the data. The simple manipulation of density. If you give the same therapy sequentially rather than concurrently without changing the schedule, you still have a statistically significant impact on recurrence and on, and on, and on survival, breast cancer survival uh, from, uh, from this manipulation. So proof of density, proof of sequentiality, which is basically the only way you can get that is if the model is true and if the protein growth is true. Um, uh, if you, um, uh, and, and you can do other manipulations, the sequential versus the concurrent, this, this gets better. If you do all 25 trials, again, diluting good ones and bad ones, it still holds up. Uh, and, and people say, well, maybe it's more, more toxic. Actually, uh, death without recurrence, which is all cause mortality, is uh, not increased, so it is not more toxic. And all cause mortality is actually reduced because it actually, it, it, it's chemo preventive for breast cancer on the other side, interestingly enough. So probably curing some people with subclinical cancer that would have recurred with contralateral disease. It's the only, or maybe other cancers, you, you know, in, in this kind of setting. But it certainly decreases all-cause mortality, not just breast cancer-specific mortality. Um, uh, for, the, for any of you who are clinicians out there, you say, well, maybe it works in estrogen receptor negative disease. Yes, it does, but it also works in estrogen receptor positive disease. You can't find any subset where it doesn't work. All right. That's all I'm going to say about that, all right? Because gompertzian growth is true or else you wouldn't have gotten those results with 34,000 randomized patients. And it can improve cancer therapy. What is the etiology of gompertzian growth and why does, does that translate into the therapeutic, um, the therapeutic uh, benefits that we saw? Um, so I'm sitting in my office worrying about this, all right? And, and to give you some sense of how preoccupied I've been with this, with, with trying to figure this thing out all these years, 
I'm giving a similar talk to this a few years back in, in Aspen. They saw something called the Ideas Festival. And I'm giving a similar talk to this in Aspen. And I'm, I have to park my car and I'm waiting for another car to come out so I can go to that spot. And inadvertently, I'm blocking somebody from pulling out of her parking space. So she comes out very angry and she stands by my window, hands on hips, and she says, and she, and she looks, looks at me really angry. She says, what's your problem? And I said, the molecular etiology of gum protein growth. What's yours? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking about at the time. You know? So preoccupied with this, with this kind of problem. So I get this phone call from a, a very famous Catalan experimental biologist named, named Joan Massage, right? uh, who is right now the head of Sloan Carrot Institute at Memorial Hospital, was the investigator at this time. He said, Larry, I got a problem, a biological problem. All right. So this is a tumor that we grow. It's MDA, MB231. It's a pretty standard model. We grow it and it has a certain DNA expression pattern. And uh, you, know, you put it in the flank and it sits there. And occasionally, it develops lung metastases. So if you take the lung metastases out and wash them, we implant them in, in a mammary fat pad, and you do a few iterations or flank, doesn't matter, and you do a few iterations of this you know, you know, a few times, you could develop sublines, 47, 4175 is the main one, that has a very different gene expression pattern and has a very high propensity for lung metastasis. We call these LM2 cells, lung metastasis 2. The middle one is lung metastasis 1, all right? So we can get a better one than LM2 cells, all right? And I said, well, that's really cool. I mean, you obviously have enriched for these metastasis-causing genes, you know, which are there, they call the lung metastasis signature. We can talk for hours about each gene, but I'm going to leave this out for the purpose of this talk because I want to get on to a few other things. He says, this is the problem. If, if you look at the growth of these tumors in the mammary fat pad, uh, the ones that the, the, the 4175s that go to the lung also grow faster in the mammary fat pad. They grow faster in the mammary fat pad, whereas the parental line with a very low probability of, of lung metastases grows very, very slowly. And, and it is, it's, a, it's a clinical question, Larry. Do, pan, do patients who have metastases tend to have faster growing tumors? Is that ap yes, it's very, very clear. That's, that's a very, very common observation. He says, here's the puzzle, is that when we measure the KI67, SA's fraction, uh, they're all the same. So how can something be growing faster um, when it has the same percentage of dividing cells as something that's growing more slowly? There's a disconnect between the KI67 and, and the growth rate. And because um, my, my, my OCD over, over decades has been obsessing about gum protein growth, suddenly the answer to all my questions was answered. His, his question, as well as my puzzle about gum protein growth, instantaneously popped into my head at that particular moment in time. And I told it to him, and he thought it was a great idea, and we wrote up his hypothesis with no data to support it. And then three years later, published it in Cell, which I'll show you the data supporting the hypothesis. And it's very simple is that we know that cancers grow and they, and they divide and they make a lump and we know that they can enter the circulation and they can become metastatic, all right? Why can't they be metastatic back to themselves? He says, it makes a lot of logical sense that they can be metastatic back to themselves. That's an organ that they really like to be in and their environment you know, is, has been changed by the presence of the, of the cancer. And we called it, we, we, we struggled through a lot of names for it. We went through Latin, we went through Catalan, we went through, and we finally ended up with English. We called it self-seeding, the ability to seed oneself. And it's very logical. It's here, here you have three lumps. And if you have three lumps, I, I've lost my pointer, but if you have three lumps growing at rate X each, it grows three times faster than one lump growing at rate X. When you measure rate X, you're going to come up with the same number, KS67, but it's going to grow faster because it's a conglomerate. And, um, and so the, is self-seeding, uh, it's an explanation. Now, why is it an explanation for gum protein growth? We're going to get to that in a second. First, we have to prove, is it true? And Mi Young Kim, who's now a professor in, in Korea, um, uh, doing really excellent work uh, on, on related topics, did a really simple experiment, took the same cells, LM2 cells, uh, different fluorescent proteins. Obviously, we've got rainbow now, and got a lot of other ways of asking more sophisticated questions, but, was, but, but, but different fluorescent proteins, put them in different, in, in different mammary fat pads, different sides of the mouse, and they exchange. And you can't tell which one of these is left, which one of these is right, they're together. I've lost my, oh, there it is. Uh, which one's left or right, because basically the, 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 um, the, the, the red side collected green cells and the green side collected red cells, and the cells exchange one side to the other. This is invisible if you just do H&E. &E. All you see is cancer, all right? You don't know, what, and, and you assume that those are cells that kind of grew there, but in fact, they can come in and metastasize one, one spot to the other. 
and and a lot of other experiments. Obviously, to publish and sell, you got to do three hundred experiments. You know, you implant the tumor, you wait it to grow for ten days, then you put the LM two metastatic cells into the heart, and it and it feeds the tumor. Watch this; it's really cool. When you inject it, the cells go all over, and so they're fluorescent all over. But by the end of forty two days, they're only growing where this tumor, this original tumor, was implanted. All right, this is not the metastatic tumor. I put the metastatic cells into the heart but the metastatic cells go all around the circulation and only grow in the tumor. They're not in the lung. These are LM2 cells. These cells were developed because of their propensity for lung metastasis, but they don't go to the lung. They go to the implanted tumor because they're more comfortable there. Cancer cells prefer to go home. So we said, it's impossible for them not to go to the lung. The fact is they do go to the lung. So here, if you inject them, they go to the lung, but then later, if you implant a tumor, this tumor sucks cells out of the lung. And you'll actually live longer with an implanted flank tumor than if you don't, because you can live longer with a subcutaneous mass than you can with a lung full of metastases. So that, and this, this basically shows the fluorescence over time and, and the increase in, 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 the, um, in the recipient tumor of, of these particular cells. And you can see this paper in Cell 2009 and a lot of other experiments in this, in, this, in this regard, which are fascinating. This one really interests me as a clinician because the fact is that if you go to Africa or you go to Thailand, you go to, you know, you see women with enormous breast tumors. I mean, huge like this without metastases. And you say, how is it that they're not metastasizing? They are just all coming back to the tumor. You take the tumor off, like we now do with a lumpectomy or mastectomy, whatever too. So, and we radiate the breast. We make this very inhospitable to the cells. They got to go elsewhere, so they form distant metastases. So we change the natural history of the disease. I went back over to the Middlesex Hospital in London, all right, where they actually before before the Halstead radical mastectomy and what patients died of in breast cancer. In, in, and, and they keep really immaculate records. You know, you know, it's, it's like the Yale Library. I mean, it's an old fashioned medical library. They died of local disease. They died of infection. They broke through the skin. Most of them stayed home until it broke through the skin, got infected. They were mostly admitted for odor control. And, um, and they died of infections because of the local disease. Breast cancer used to be a locally fatal disease rather than a metastatic disease. We cause metastasis by effective local therapy. So, so this is the insight that you've got to be a mathematical nerd to have appreciated. If you're growing from the outside in, it explains Gomperitian pattern of growth since as objects get larger, the surface area to volume ratio decreases, all right? So that's a little tiny tumor that has a big surface area related to its volume. As it gets bigger, the surface area to volume ratio goes down. When it's very big, there's a very big surface area to volume. This is why mice of Florian elephants aren't. Uh, because mice have a very big surface area to volume ratio and they have trouble keeping their heat in. Elephants have trouble getting rid of their heat because they have such a big volume related to a relatively small surface area. Your surface area increases by the square of your height, your volume increases by the cube of your height. And so that ratio changes as you get bigger, all right? And so, you know, very, very large people, you know, don't get cold in the winter, little skinny people do. And so, and so, and so it's all related to very, very simple geometry. And not only that, but the pattern of what it looks like, this is like a snowflake because, because basically it's coming from the outside, it's gonna stick on the, on the fronds, uh, like water vapor freezing on the, on the fringes rather than going into the center. And this is what cancers look like. Here's an MRI of a breast cancer. This is what, this is what breast cancers look like. You, you, this is an MRI, standard garden variety breast cancer. This is, this is what breast cancer looks like. We all know this. It's not one lump, it's a bunch of little lumps all stuck together as a conglomerate with long skinny tendrils. This is the pattern of growth, and it's because it's growing from the outside in because it's self seeding And um, any pathologist will tell you looking at this, you know, good prognosis breast cancer, bad prognosis breast cancer. If you have low self seeding this is mostly driven by mitotic irregularities. But if it's a high self seeding and these cells are coming from the outside, of course, it's going to look very disorganized. And so entropy, organization, is slowly correlated car with this. And that's actually the major area that I'm working with my mathematical colleagues on tying together the mathematics of entropy, uh, something called optimal mass transport and entropy in, in trying to understand the process. I'm not going to go into details. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I'll show you. I'll show, we're, going to get to the, we're going to get there in a second, I hope. But, but, all right, I hope I have that slide. If I don't, then I'll answer your question at the end. All right. So some clinical implications. One thing that we thought of very, very obviously very early days, you know, because we had Jim Allison working with us at Memorial at the time, just won the Nobel Prize is if you have a tumor, and if this tumor is circulating with circulating tumor cells causing metastasis, uh, and, 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 and it's uh, circulating back to self-seeding, self 
uh, hypothesize that a metastasis can metastasize to a metastasis, uh, hypothesize then that circulating tumor cells from metastatic sites may come back into the uh, may come back into the tumor. This makes this the opportunity. That, I mean, this is home for the cancer cells while it's there, right? And I said, if you remove it with a mastectomy, you know, you're changing the biology. Why not take advantage of this? So I, 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 I approached Jamalis and I said, what can we do to take advantage of it? And we developed a very simple approach. Uh, the, pre the tumor is still present. We stick a needle into it. We freeze it. When it thaws, it releases all sorts of immunogenic lock. And then with the release of antigens and T-cell stimulation, if we give anti-CTLA-4, the drug that, that, you know, that, that he developed, we might be able to convert that tumor into a poison sponge that sucks up the cancer cells and the immunological competence in this artificial abscess we've made uh, can then, can then uh, kill the cancer cells. So we did the experiment, which we published in Cancer Research uh, and with Becky Waits uh, and, and Jim Allison and myself and a couple of colleagues. Uh, no treatment is green. If you just give the anti cd 4 the checkpoint inhibitor, you don't do very much. If you just do partial abrasion of the tumor, you don't do very much. If you do them together, you cure 90% of the cancers. And this shows the, this shows the survival curve. This is the survival curve. Um, this, um, these, the, the, if you waited long enough, these tumors would be metastatic, but we did an artificial metastasis, which is basically we planted a contralateral tumor uh, to make sure that we had a metastasis and it still worked. And it still works, okay? Because remember, I already known that these cells are gonna exchange. I already done that experiment, all right? And so we did a clinical study, which we published, clinical breast cancer, stick a needle in, freeze it, and when it thaws, it has all this glop. And, and then we did immunological measurements of the degree of stimulation. I won't go into this in detail. It's, it's published, published work. Heather MacArthur, who's now um, in California, has done this work. And, uh, and you get profound immunological stimulation. And now a therapeutic trial is, is about to ensue, actually looking at this um, in the setting of, of residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, for the clinicians out there, I could talk to you about it if you like. But basically, it's the idea of when you have residual cancer, turning it into a poison sponge immunologically. Other simpler things. This is work uh, from, from Jusic and Veselga, another Catalan colleague of mine, uh, looking at an effective PA3 kinase inhibitor, but that a patient with a primary lesion and metastatic sites, when the patient develops resistance, in fact, you often find uh, that, that, in this case, four different sites have the same resistance mutation. It is mathematically impossible, or my colleagues here who study evolution, very, very unlikely that you can get exactly the same mutation in different sites, like, likely that arose in one site and it's seeded, and it's seeded additional sites. You, I'm getting a head shake. Yes, so I've been saying it for years. So I'm glad I'm right. <laughs> all right. So here's blood vessels. You ready? Um, so in the same paper, all right, unseeded tumor. All right, when you when when you when you when you seed it, it brings in blood vessels. These are endothelial cells that are brought in. that marrow derived endothelial cells. We've actually we've shown that that come in with the seeds. When the seed is there, the, the they either come in together. We don't know this, but they act as an attractant. Huh? The blood vessels, no, they come from the bone marrow. They're endothelial by, by labeling, by, by labeling experiments that were that were done. It's in the paper. You can you can you can see this. All right, it's in the paper. It's in Cell 2009. You see the experiments, and they they're endothelial derived uh, cells that come in, and it also brings in leukocytes. I you know next time I come I'll talk more about the the, the blood vessels, which is very interesting. I want to talk about the leukocytes for a second because of another very important clinical observation that we've made, another observation we've made in this regard is that unseeded site, uh, the, the CD45, these, these are the white cells. You see a great enrichment of white cells when, when, when the seeds come in and uh, the, um, uh, the, the tumor cells here are, are in green, all right? Um, and, uh, and, and we're fascinated by these white cells. So we studied them and we found they do things. And, uh, and uh, one of the things they do, all right, is they provide by, by a mechanism involving three different cell types, all right, which was again hypothesized many years ago by Jose Costa. There's going to get relationship between these various cells. They, they're, going to, they're going to function together. Then when you give chemotherapy to the cancer cell, we don't know what the signal is, but it induces TNF alpha production by the endothelial cells that are, mar that are marrow derived. And then, and then when that happens, the cancer cell secretes CXCO1, which goes to its receptor, CXCR2, on the white cells, which then secrete S100 proteins, which provide a degree of protection. In this case, I'll show you, I'll show you the actual, actual the data. Swanali Akaria did this, she's now in Columbia. These are the cancer cells, they're black. These are the LM2 cells. Uh, if we just give the inhibitor, nothing happens of CXCR2. 
if we give chemotherapy, we induce that loop, but we kill some cancer cells, but not all of them. But if then if you combine the chemotherapy with an inhibitor of that pathway, you get total disease eradication. I've been fighting for years to try to get the drug. There is a good CXCR2 inhibitor to get the drug for clinical trials. And we finally got it. We've done preclinical work. We're going to start a clinical trial to test this. So it took a long time to actually get the drug. because It's an anti-inflammatory drug. And so companies was a little nervous about necessarily using it in the cancer setting, but we are going to be using it in the cancer setting. So this is not turned into clinical trial yet, but momentarily it's going to turn into a clinical trial in this regard. We then asked this question, and I'll tell you why we asked this question. All right. We asked this question because I was hearing Ross Levine, one of our leukemia experts, present at a retreat. And he says, by the way, when you get to be really old like Larry Norton, you're going to have mutant white cells. All right. And because um, everybody as they age develop mutations in their white cells, a lot of them are known leukemogenic mutations, but thank God we don't all have leukemia. All right. But you will find these circulating cells. And it's called clonal hematopoiesis, all right, of abnormal cells. And I said, that's really fascinating. Um, has anybody looked at the white cells? Has any genotype the white cells infiltrating cancers? Uh, he, two days later, he called me and said, I searched the literature. I can't find anybody doing it. Let's do it. We micro dissected out the white cells. We genotype them. Um, we find leukemogenic mutations enriched in almost all primary breast cancers. This paper we published uh, a couple of years ago was, was 60%, but we weren't sequencing deeply enough. If you sequence deeply enough, almost all the cancers have mutant white cells. 25% um, of the cancer patients have circulating mutant white cells, if you look, uh, if you look, and we, we got this because we're doing screening patients for this particular reason. They have a higher incidence of leukemia. They have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. So now we're going to look at the white cells infiltrating the intima of, of, our, of, 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 uh, of clotted, clotted vessels or clotting vessels that are taken out by our colleagues uh, doing, uh, doing cardiac surgery and doing vascular surgery. You know, we don't know yet, but we're looking at that. But the very fact of the matter is um, that uh, DNMT3A is, the mo uh, is, is, is common, IDH2, we're going to see TET2 is also extremely common. And we have animal experiments now trying to figure out what mutant white cells harboring these mutations do to promote tumor growth. The short answer is they do. They also provide a mechanism of resistance to chemotherapy. All right, you could do conditional models, turn them off, and you could, you could, you could, you could resume th therapy. And so these white cells, um, are doing things that are protecting the cancer. They're not just there, and these white cells can also be uh, genotypically abnormal, and that also is something that we have to actually pursue. Last point I want to make in this, and I want to get back to the math a little bit, because the equation that, that Gompertz used to express this was rewritten by us uh, and is in that original paper in 2005, if anybody wants to see it. Because I, we think that Gompertz got the shape of the curve right, but got the equation wrong. And you could write a very simple equation that actually expresses self-seeding and also gives you the shape of the Gompertz curve based on the observation, based on the statements I made before about, about cells coming in from the outside to growth on the outside rather than growth from the inside. Now, if growth is cell gain minus cell loss, then cell gain is two things. It's mitosis, and it's also accepting seeds, which is immigration. And cell loss is two things. It's death, apoptosis, necrosis, mechanism of death, and cells leaving to be able to circulate. So that the growth equation now becomes pretreatment, mitosis plus immigration minus death minus emigration gives you the growth curve. So just sort of accept this, all right? Now, the very fact that the rate of regression of a Gompertsian tumor is proportional to its rate of growth, remember, I, I, we, it was a hard observation. It led to a clinically useful way of using drugs, but we didn't have an explanation for it, why that is the case. However, if indeed, because it's the case, that means that these plus things, all right, have to turn minus, and these minus things have to turn plus. It's the only way to give you this observation, all right? For you mathematicians, play with it, and you'll see it's the only way you're gonna get it. And that means that when you treat you're killing mitotic cells, but you're probably also increasing the seeding phenomenon. That's what the math suggests is going on. So now we have to turn to experimental biology. Is there a mechanism by which this can occur? And so um, to make a very long story short, work with Rachel Hazan, I'm sorry I don't have her name here, is at Einstein, very close collaborator, all right, has found a mechanism and that relates to, and there's probably a dozen mechanisms, but this is the one that we zeroed in, which is P21. When you expose the cells to chemotherapy, you um, can you um, increase P21 expression dramatically. 
And that actually takes mitotic cells, makes them quiescent, and then they die by apoptosis. But simultaneously with that, it increases cell migration. Decreased mitosis, increased death, increased, increased, increased migration. And you can see this because migrated cells go way up when P21 is on, and P21 could be on because you're putting it in knockout cells or because you're inducing its expression with chemotherapy. So in sum, and I'm, my timing is like impeccable, I'm going to end exactly at the right moment. See? This is, you know, you know, 72 years of giving talks, you get good at it, all right? All right. Cancer seems mysterious if you zero in just on abnormalities in the cancer cell itself, all right? I mean, a great paper that Jose co-authored, um, I think 2012, about cooperation between cell types, between between uh, oncogene and oncogene cells and tumor suppressive you know, phenomena. I won't go into those details, but you need cooperation between cells to actually make it. The growth model is not simple, but it's not that hard to dissect. It involves cell mobility as well as mitosis and apoptosis that makes sense. Mobility is a mechanism for drug resistance because, because mutated cells can migrate and can infect other areas, all right? Uh, I wanna get back to that in a second because it's not, not, not formal part of the talk yet, but I wanna get back to that. But it allows us therapeutically to think about manipulating the environment, examining the white cells, maybe targeting the mutant white cells, which we're thinking about doing, uh, using the cryoablation and immunotherapy, as well as specific, specific molecules that may be targeted with precision medicine in conjunction with other drugs. And now we're not just doing, let's have three sharpshooters, you know, boom, boom. Now we're actually picking what we're gonna be doing very specifically, taking in, involved in the complexity. The other thing that we've learned very recently, and I just wanna share this with you, I don't have a slide on it yet, is that when these cells are in transit, they're in G0. When they're G0, you can't kill them with chemotherapy. So that, so that metastasis is not just a consequence, basically, of drug resistance and drugs being left right. Metastasis can be a cause of drug resistance. And while the cells are in transit, they're not going to be able to be killed. And when you have a highly mobile population, like in triple negative breast cancer, why doesn't that respond well to treatment? If the cells are moving around, they're going to be blind to the therapy. It's only when they're fixed, you know? Whereas, like, you know, the luminal A's, you know, are much more responsive to therapy because they're not seeding as much, for example. So we start to develop a comprehensive picture that takes these things into account. Um, ending right on time. Thank you all so very much. Uh, question or two? Or? All right. Okay. Hey. Yeah. Um, well, it, yeah, no, no, I'm, and, and, and that could be really bad ones. I mean, I think that the, um, you know, there's a toolbox for, for the for metastases and the kinds of growth factors they like, and they may like this organs more than they like the primary site. Um, and, those, and I think the, the, the cancer that I think is the, the most seeding cancer that we've seen so far is uh, pancreas. Pancreas may not form a mass at all. In other words, you know, divides, moves, divides, moves, never really forms a mass because it's not really very much self-seeding, it's more distance seeding. So there's a, you know, there's a yin yang that's going to be involved here in that process. And obviously dissecting genes that are, con that, that are consequential for that is very important because I think the next major advance is, uh, you know, obviously I'm pursuing the immunotherapy part, the targeted therapy part with P21 and so on, and many other things. But I think we need anti-mitotic drugs. And if we just use anti-mitotic drugs by themselves, they're not going to do a thing. We have to use them together with chemotherapy for them to have any activity whatsoever. And, and we may already have that. There's a drug aribulin that may be anti-mitotic, anti-migration, anti and maybe why it can prolong survival without actually making tumors shrink. So we may have hints there. But, but I'm hoping that we'll get hints from actually the molecular biology of, 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 of seeds. Uh, we could talk more about that offline, about how we're approaching that. So we can actually look for what is, what is, what's the genetic basis for this. P21 is obviously something that's interesting in this regard because it's reciprocal with, with mitosis, but obviously it's going to be very complex. But I think the next big wave of anti-cancer drugs that we have to develop are anti-migration drugs to use with our anti-mitotic drugs. You're saying the tumor cells are getting the other tissue, back into the tumor tissue. Right. They must do that to the cells. Yes. Yeah, you know, this it's a very good question because you know, obviously, inflammation is all about white cells, signaling white cells, and 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 obviously, that's something of great interest. And we absolutely know that inflammation is key to carcinogenesis in many respects, and you know, and and uh, you know, in this regard, um, there there are some hints. It's never been really studied well enough in this regard to really understand. And maybe that 
that the time to study it is in the prevention mode rather than not. But there are some very fascinating hints in terms of various drugs that are used in surgical anesthesia. Some of them being uh, that are actually anti-inflammatory drugs, you know, that also are being used for pain relief, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, with, with some of them actually potentially improving the prognosis and decreasing recurrence rates after surgery, all right? And, um, and so there's some hints that there may be something there. People have been trying to do this in developing clinical trial, access those drugs for that purpose, funding for those has, has really been, been an issue. But there are some hints that actually anti-inflammatory drugs properly used may actually have some anti-metastatic, anti-migration activities. So it's a, it's a, it's a very, good, very good point. Okay, I think we have to stay on time, but- Okay, thank you, thank you so, thank so, you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.